Good afternoon. On behalf of the National Association for Rights Protection, aka NARPA, I am pleased to welcome you to the promises and pitfalls of 988 survivor advocacy perspectives. First, a big thank you to the folks at Disability Rights California, DRC, for hosting this webinar. Thanks also to all of you who registered to participate in this, the second of the fall series of webinars presented by the National Association for Rights Protection and Advocacy. As president of the board of directors, I am proud of the way we have evolved in spite of the pandemic and in the absence of face-to-face -face conferencing to further our mission of educating, empowering, and encouraging advocates who work with and for people with psychiatric diagnoses. This webinar series is in keeping with our goal of supporting the legal and human rights of people with psychiatric diagnoses. We will try to make each of these webinars accessible on NARPA's YouTube channel as soon after this session as possible. So thanks in advance to all of you who will share that link far and wide once it is available. And with that, I'm happy to introduce Vanessa Ochoa of Disability Rights California. Vanessa? Hello, everyone, and welcome. Bienvenidos a todos. Thank you for joining this webinar today. Closed captioning is available. If you would like to turn on or off the closed captioning, please locate the CC icon at the bottom of your screen and select show subtitles or hide the subtitles. It brings me so much joy to share this space with fellow advocates, individuals with lived experience and community allies. My name is Vanessa Ochoa and I am the advisor at Disability Rights California in the Strategic Partnership and Community Engagement Unit. I'm also one of the many leaders of our Latinx employee resource group within our agency. Disability Rights California, DRC, is the agency designated under federal law to protect and advocate for the rights of Californians with all types of disabilities. I have light brown skin and I'm a Latina woman. My pronouns are she, her, ella. I have dark brown hair tied back tightly in a ponytail. I have on a dark blue blouse and I'm wearing gold earrings in the shapes of Chihuahua dogs. My Zoom background is the NARPA logo um, in black and white and the torch has blue flames. Today's topic is near and dear to my heart. As a person that identifies as an individual with lived experience and the parent of children with various disabilities, I worry every day what could happen to my adult daughter with autism if she has a behavior and is faced with an encounter with law enforcement without the proper awareness of her disability and even her communication challenges. My biggest fear is me not being there to advocate on her behalf. And I don't even wanna think about what could possibly happen if I wasn't there. On behalf of all of my colleagues at DRC, we are honored to host today's event. And we have some wonderful individuals presenting information today. And I hand over um, the microphone to Leah Harris. Thank you so, so much, Vanessa. And huge thanks to NARPA and DRC uh, for making this event possible today. I'll start with the visual description. Um, I am a white, uh, light olive kind of person with short brown hair. I'm wearing a black tie-dyed sweatshirt and behind me are a couple of plants and a jar full of seashells. So just to let you know a little bit about myself, again, my name is Leah Harris. I use they and she pronouns. I am a writer, facilitator. I'm a parent of a teen who's learning how to drive. And so that's another topic for a different webinar. <laughs> um, I actually got my advocacy start with NARPA about 20 years ago. So I'm totally aging myself right now. Um, and my advocacy work is based um, as a person with lived experience, um, as a suicide attempt survivor, 
Um, I have been that child in the back of a cop car in handcuffs. Um, and all of those things were happening while our family was white. So I'm aware of the differing impacts. And in my work advising with the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline, um, for years I've been very concerned about the impacts of race and suicide prevention. Um, and when they announced um, this 988 initiative, I've, I've been a very outspoken critic of it because I am concerned. And we're gonna talk a lot more about that today. So that was really the rationale as to why I put this panel together, because um, we really need to hear uh, these advocacy perspectives. So that's enough about me for now. And with that, I will turn it over to Vic. Thank you so much. Thanks, Leah. Um, my name is Vic Welly. I do not use pronouns. Folks are welcome to call me by name or use they them pronouns for me. As a visual description of myself, um, I am a white genderqueer person with short brown hair and large black glasses. Um, today I'm wearing a gray button down shirt with a collar and I am attending today virtually from my home office. Um, and in the background is a white wall with um, brightly colored abstract art in the background and some uh, green plants that I, I hope are, are green, but uh, could use some tending to. Um, I am I'm currently located in the Midwest of the United States, um, where I am working in a couple of different roles. Um, I bring my experience as a psychiatric survivor as somebody who has planned suicide attempts and ex still experiences um, times of, of wanting to die by suicide. Um, somebody who has a direct experience of trauma related to police violence and who has also experienced harm um, from so-called wellness checks. In my current work, I am a trainer for peer support. Um, I serve on the Wisconsin Certified Peer Specialist Advisory Committee. And I'm the co-founder of Monarch House Peer Run Respite, which is a crisis alternative I'm excited to talk a little bit more about today. I'm now gonna turn it over to Jess. Hi everyone, my name is Jess. I use she and her pronouns. I am a white settler located in so-called Denver, which is the land stolen from the Arapaho, Cheyenne, and Ute and Sioux people. Um, I'm a fat white femme with short, like orange creamsicle kind of colored hair. I have a septum ring, uh, multicolored round glasses, a tiger's eye necklace. Otherwise I'm wearing all black. Um, I talk with my hands a lot and have rings all over um, my fingers and my, I have tattoos on my fingers that say stay soft. Um, also have a tattoo on my hand that says dead and um, one on the side of my hand that says um, sad and it's a stick and poke. So it's fading out pretty badly. Um, I have a moon tarot tattoo across my chest. There's lots more, but those are the visible ones. And I'm at a desk with a dining table and bookshelf full of weird oddities and radical books and some plants in the background. Um, I identify as a mad person, specifically someone who hears voices and as someone who is uh, suicidal a lot. And because of my experience with what gets called psychosis and suicide, I have experienced so-called welfare checks, uh, psychiatric incarceration and abuse, including seclusion, physical and chemical restraint, sexual and physical violence in those spaces. Um, they also want to note that as a white person, my experiences primarily took place within the mental health facilities and not the larger cultural or carceral system, but I do have some record, um, criminal record because of that, um, and would probably have much more if I was a person of color. Um, I'm a critical suicidologist in my work life, and I'm interested in work at the intersections of lived experience, liberation, and mental health. I feel pretty strongly about not um, sort of thinking about and talking about this work unless we're also participating in it. Um, I teach in a PsyD program at the University of Denver Graduate School of Professional Psychology. And then I'm also the Director of Program Development at Rocky Mountain Crisis Partners. And we provide the crisis and peer support lines for Colorado's crisis system, which is a pretty like robust, big system that has been 
developed over um, the last seven years or so. Um, so I'm going to talk a lot about that. And um, that's the way that I was involved in um, how 988 is going to look in Colorado, which is um, probably different than what you'll hear from some of the other states. So I'm really interested in how we disrupt systems and engage them in more effective practices while we're also kind of working to dismantle them. So that's the space that I come to all of this from. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. Make sure I have sound, okay. Um, I think screen share should be working for everyone. Uh, so I wanted to go ahead and start us out um, with a land acknowledgement. Uh, I think it's important to note that this kind of acknowledgement is not a new practice at all. Um, it is something that uh, indigenous communities have done for a long time and many other countries keep as a practice pretty consistently. We're not as great about it in, in the United States. Um, this is a powerful way to me for us to show respect and honor the indigenous people, the land on which we work and live. Uh, acknowledgement is a simple way of resisting the erasure of indigenous history and working toward uh, honoring and inviting the truth. I want to acknowledge that while we are gathered electronically, we're also physically present on the ancestral grounds of indigenous peoples. We will each speak to indigenous groups in our areas, but I also want to hold and honor that it is only acts of colonialism that forced indigenous people to give up their nomadic ways of being and stake claim to some of these particular spaces. We want to offer respect to the original caretakers of the lands where we are all located today and their elders past, present, and emerging. I also want to recognize the impact of colonization on suicide among Indigenous people across the world. We cannot separate the grief and loss of this time from all that came before, including the effects of colonization and racialized violence that continue to echo in this country today. I'm just going to take a moment to have some silence to acknowledge the people that have been lost in the land. Thanks for holding that space with us. I want to talk a little bit about um, the stages of social movements. There's many theories about uh, stages of social movements, but I think uh, it's helpful to just give some context for 988 and what's coming and, and what's happened um, in this framework. So the, the social movement theory that I've uh, used here is adapted from um, Bloomer, Mouse, and Tilly um, that we're all working in the 60s and 70s. Um, I think it's a sort of simple way to understand how social movements evolve and decline. Um, so when hotlines started, specifically suicide prevention hotlines started in this country, they were formed by community members impacted by suicide and primarily by lost survivors, which I think is pretty important. Um, lost survivors tend to engage a little bit differently um, with this work than people with their own uh, direct lived or living experience. Uh, but these lost survivors were responding to a community need and, and the need was real because people called. Uh, so they set up, you know, in their homes and sometimes networks of places for people to call when they're struggling. Um, as things evolved, uh, there were sort of groups of these networks of people who were answering calls that appeared. Um, they got more complex in different ways. Um, and you started seeing uh, the emergence of warm lines and warm lines are uh, peer support lines that uh, might do similar work or sometimes do different work and often include a callback service instead of a live answer service. Uh, where things really get interesting is when we start bureaucratizing a social movement, right? So this originally was um, people responding to needs in the community. Uh, but eventually these networks got bigger, they became nonprofits, and, uh, and then the government started funding them. And the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline um, has, has sort of emerged as the sort of bureaucratizing agent for this work. And the National, National Suicide Prevention Lifeline has been around for quite a while. It is a network of call centers, so it isn't one place, which is sometimes confusing, um, but each, uh, each center sort of runs according to a set of standards that the lifeline develops, but they can run really, really differently individually. So each center might 
um, be like volunteer run versus a center that could be um, run by um, people who are paid staff. Sometimes it's clinical staff, sometimes it's people with lived experience and they all do sort of different things in different ways. Um, so that's sort of the way that it has evolved. Um, and the reason that people can have such a different experience when they call the current suicide prevention lifeline. Um, uh, not too long ago, the FCC designated 988 to be the new number. So it's shifting the suicide prevention lifeline number to be a mental health crisis number for the country. That's a three digit number similar to 911. Uh, so that's what 988 is. Um, and it is still going to be a network, um, but the network has some different guidelines to it. So um, there are standards that each state has to meet and the burden is really falling on states instead of whoever wants to volunteer to be a part of the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline. Now to be a participating center in the Lifeline currently in the Lifeline network, um, you get about $2,500, something like that a year for participating. So funding the Lifeline is up to each state. And that's going to be true again under this new model. Um, most of the funding for the Lifeline comes from the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration. That comes, that's the funding that comes to the sort of national headquarters. And states and individual centers are really responsible for funding their current work. So I think this is important because it really gets at um, some of the differences that you'll see in the way that states are responding to um, the call to uh, have 988 active and running in July of next year. Um, the relationship between SAMHSA and um, the Lifeline Network is interesting because um, SAMHSA is the primary funder. They drive lots of the research. Um, most of the Lifeline grants that exist are driven by SAMHSA funding. Um, so that relationship is close, but they're not the same place. Lifeline is, uh, the Lifeline network is run out of an organization called Vibrant Emotional Health in New York City um, currently. And that goes out to bid every five years or something like that. Um, so we're in this place right now where um, the Lifeline has really already been, been bureaucratized or hotlines for um, supporting people in crisis have been bureaucratized already. And we're in this like heightened space of bureaucratization. And so the options for things that can happen is that something can be successful. Um, and I think we want, ought to define what success would mean because um, that can be really complicated. It could be a failure. Um, it could get co-opted, which I think is the thing that to me is the biggest risk right now. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, the movement could be repressed or it can go mainstream. And I think what's happening right now is it's certainly going mainstream. Co-optation is a pretty strong factor. And um, we have chances for this to be pretty successful or, or really problematic. So um, the national context is, that's kind of the general national context for what's going on. Behind the scenes, um, this is a time where both SAMHSA and the Lifeline are sort of taking advantage of opportunities to try to hold centers to different standards um, about this service. Um, and so really what we see happening are organizations sort of vying for power and control over how this gets implemented in local places. Lifeline, not SAMHSA, so not funded by the government and not connected to the FCC um, regulation, Lifeline used some of its own funding to create grants, planning grants for individual states. Now, these grants basically made it appear as if um, if you got the grant and then you had to follow the rules that are written out in the grant. So it tells you how to plan for 988 coming to your community. A lot of the things that were built into that give people instructions on how 988 should operate. And those instructions are not ones that came from the FCC and they're not ones that came from SAMHSA. They're the way that Lifeline is helping to control what people are going to do when they implement 988. Uh, I don't think it's necessarily a problem for us to have standards about how we implement things, but when one an individual nonprofit is, giving, is in that kind of control um, and is making those kinds of decisions and driving decisions the direction they want, 
it really intervenes with our ability to step back as communities and say, okay, so if we are going to have this service, if we are going to have a crisis line that people can call, what should that be? And one of the places that I think is most dangerous that that's getting um, prescribed by um, national organizations is around the influence and the use of law enforcement and welfare checks, um, the connection we have with carceral systems and hospitals, and some of the standards for how we implement um, our relationship in those spaces. 988 has the potential to be this really amazing system that divests crisis intervention from 911 emergency services and gives us an opportunity nationally to talk about what does it mean to respond to a mental health crisis and how do we do that most effectively in our individual communities and respond to their individual needs. But what's generally happening is that it's becoming really connected, deeply embedded with carceral systems um, and really affirming how those systems are going to be involved in crisis work. Um, so uh, the way that I see what's happening is that things are going mainstream. There's lots of co-optation uh, and there's potential for, for pretty significant failure because what we're looking at is unfunded um, in some places or sometimes funded depending on the state mandates um, discussions, uh, that sort of embed it with 911 and, um, sort of this pervasive carceral influence kind of moving in, uh, with 988. Um, so we'll talk about each of our individual organizations and our, our individual states and how things have evolved there, but they can go really differently if a state is prepared to push back, um, and has advocacy to help with that. Um, one of the big conversations to me that's happening is that peer support is explicitly written into the FCC um, discussion, but it's not been discussed at all by Lifeline, and there are no standards for it, either from SAMHSA or from Lifeline, uh, for how um, peer support is supposed to look as a part of 988. Um, so that's a safe space where individual states can really um, get involved in making some changes. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and pass it over to Vic to talk a little bit about the things that are happening in so-called Wisconsin. Thanks, Jess. All right, so um, this current slide is um, uh, shows a map of uh, what is currently called the state of Wisconsin, also known um, in the indigenous Miami language of Wisconsin. Uh, which roughly translates as river running through a red place. And this map is um, provided by wisconsinfirstnations.org and shows um, just some of the um, indigenous tribes that um, have called this land home, um, including the uh, Dakota and Ojibwe who um, were part of the region that I reside in in Northwestern Wisconsin um, along the Red Cedar River. And I want to contrast this with the, the next slide and the map on the next slide. This shows um, the 72 counties in Wisconsin. And um, this is important because uh, Wisconsin is a county-based crisis services system. So each of these counties has their own current way of participating in the continuum of crisis services. They each have their own um, 911 call center and way of responding to 911 calls. And so in this current context of trying to coordinate for 988, there are all these different autonomously run counties to um, try to organize and converse with. And then within the, this county system, you have regional call centers um, it, that some that participate with the lifeline, some that do not. It's, it's a very complicated um, sort of system. So I want to I wanna give a little bit of uh, my own experience um, with this 988 planning and just share kind of a perspective of how this has looked for a person who is an advocate who has wanted to um, provide some input and has um, had, had some mixed results with, with um, collaborating with this process. So um, Wisconsin um, was one of the states who received that, that planning grant that, that Jess mentioned. And so uh, earlier this year, um, a letter was sent out, um, somebody 
from the Wisconsin Department of Health Services, who was going to be coordinating this planning coalition, um, sent out an invitation to the various stakeholders uh, throughout the state of Wisconsin. And uh, notice, noticeably missing from this invitation was anybody with any direct lived experience, anybody representing um, peer specialists from the state of Wisconsin. And um, fortunately, uh, it did reach um, uh, some advocates at a local um, mental health agency who noticed this and um, asked about it, um, made some, some requests, and this was kind of how I, I got approached to take part in this. Um, and it was initially going to be as a, a volunteer position. Um, there was kind of this assumption that everyone who participated in this 988 planning coalition had income, was associated with either um, a county agency, a state agency, a nonprofit, um, basically had access to, to stable income and was participating by virtue of their job. So already that kind of sets up an exclusion of diverse voices and voices of lived experience. Um, so my, my experience in participating um, in, in these planning coalition meetings has been one of um, learning a lot and um, attempting to name my own experiences and also name that I can't speak for all um, people with lived experience of suicide attempts or being suicidal. Um, however, it's been an opportunity to try to um, name things that wouldn't otherwise get named in a space where uh, the rest of the people on the call um, are coming from a very different perspective. And I wanna share a, a couple of examples. Um, so one of the things that's been talked about in this planning is that this is an opportunity for uh, standardizing coordination. Um, so we've got you know, all of these different county agencies, county-based systems, and what an, what an incredible opportunity for standardizing and coordination. And inevitably this became a discussion around geolocation and how great would it be if we could just pinpoint exactly where that caller was so that we could tailor services directly for what makes sense in their particular city, county, region for crisis services. And nobody else on the call, or if they, if they thought of it, they didn't voice it. Um, it was left to me to voice that concern of um, what happens when you are violating that person's privacy they are not consenting to a wellness check. They are not consenting to having somebody um, locate them. And then naming also the history of uh, harm that happens when law enforcement is typically involved in crisis services and wellness checks and the legacy of um, not only physical harm, but death in the course of um, wellness checks. And that was, that was met with um, a mixture of uh, thanking me for bringing that to um, the attention and reminding, and then also um, naming that it is a very minor um, percentage of calls that actually end up in active rescue. And it was, it was a bit of a, a minimizing of, well, we're glad that you're concerned. Thank you for, for sharing. And it's just such a minuscule um, risk that, that it just, um, we want to talk about helping so many more other people. Um, so that's, that's kind of one example of something that I encountered. Another, another piece that I think is important to highlight, and Jess alluded to this as well, is that the plans are going forward without a clear sense of funding. And so one of the other pieces that's been brought up by um, folks who are already staffing call centers is that um, they're already short staffed and they're anticipating a huge increase in volume. And so how can that preparation happen in a meaningful way that will provide folks with the training and the necessary um, capacity to take those increased calls? 
And that became uh, a, a point of conversation where um, peer support was brought up. Um, Wisconsin has um, a peer specialist employment initiative that is um, creating these opportunities for people with lived experience to become um, employed as peer specialists and peer support workers. And so that was brought up, what a wonderful possibility. And again, because there was not that direct lived experience and that understanding of peer support values, it was another place where it was neat. I needed to name that um, peer support and the Wisconsin Peer Specialist Code of Ethics does not um, see participating in coercive practices as part of peer support. And so what kind of um, quandary are you putting these peer specialists in to put them in jobs and roles where they may be expected to participate in coercive practices like active rescue? And so those are just a couple of examples of things that, that I encountered as part of this, this 988 um, planning grant. Uh, and I'm finding myself um, worried and wanting to stay engaged, wanting to continue to advocate, and yet feeling like so many of these decisions have already been made and uncertain um, how best to continue advocating for um, supports that are actually going to provide um, meaningful ways for people to receive support that does not lead them to be um, risking further harm. I'm going to um, now pass it on over to um, Leah. Hello, can you all hear me? All right, great. I cannot see myself, but uh, trusting that you all can see me. <laughs> so um, I'm coming to you from uh, so-called Virginia and the term Seneca Maca comes from the Powhatan language. And uh, it was used for large swaths of the Commonwealth of Virginia, um, including Richmond, areas around that, um, what is called the Tidewater area. Uh, and I am presenting to you from stolen Manahoac lands. I also wanna acknowledge the history of slavery and racialized violence in these lands that I live and present on that still echoes loudly um, the Robert E. Lee statue was finally removed from Richmond this month, but as we're making clear in this presentation and, and just from, you know, the general state of this country, there's an enormous amount of work to do. Next slide, please. So here uh, in Virginia, I mean, and let me say first again that I, you know, I've been serving on the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline um, Lived Experience Advisory Council for a number of years. So these issues that have been discussed so far are issues that <laughs> I and many others have raised with them for a long time. So I think that's why it's uh, particularly frustrating um, that some of these issues that many of us flagged a long time ago, um, you know, were not uh, listened to. So just to give some background here in Virginia, um, the reform process um, really, I say reform in quotes, uh, really began after the May 2018 police killing of Marcus Davis Peter, Marcus David Peters, uh, who was an unarmed 24 year old black high school biology teacher who was experiencing a mental health crisis. And the bill, and also obviously at the same time, there were the uprisings of 2020 and lots of pressure uh, on the legislators here and so this bill, which was called the Marcus Alert Bill, was created and um, signed into law nearly a year ago. 
Um, and so that's a picture on the left hand side of Marcus David Peters, a young black man smiling, uh, looking at the camera. And then on the right hand side is a picture of Princess Blanding and Governor Ralph Northam and another legislator who I am um, blanking on at this point in time. And Ralph Northam, our white governor, is handing Princess Blanding um, a ceremonial pen. And when I was thinking of the caption of this, I was thinking, they will kill your family and then hand you a ceremonial pen. Um, but I wanna give a Princess Blanding an opportunity to speak in her own words about this. So Jess, if you're cool to cue up this video, and this was at the signing of the legislation. Thank you, Governor Northam, for this invitation to attend this bill signing ceremony for the Marcus Alert bill um, that you signed um, in November. I would like to thank Governor Ralph Northam, Delegate Jeff Bourne, Senator Jennifer McCullen, and let's not forget Senator McPike as well for bringing us here today at this moment. Please take a moment to uh, pat yourselves on the back for doing exactly what this racist, corrupt system, and broken, may I also add, expected you all to do. Make the Marcus Alert Bill a watered down, ineffective bill that will continue to ensure that having a mental health crisis results in a death sentence. Marcus David Peters, along with so many others, deserves help, not death. Although the Virginia Democratic Party is the majority in both the House, Senate, and yes, we do have a Democratic governor, you all have succeeded again at felling the people and making this bill, along with the CRB bill, ineffective. Let's not forget how you all killed the bill to end qualified immunity and refuse to meet the seven Richmond demands. So in summary, I say to you all, thank you again, because you all have absolutely succeeded in lighting the fire in me and so many others that is impossible to take out. Yes, we can go I ahead. I say to each and every one of you. So um, she's uh, sharing here how she's going to be running for the governor of Virginia. So if you want to support her campaign, <laughs> her name is Princess Blanding. Next slide, please. So I wanna talk about maybe some of you who have worked in bureaucratic spaces have heard this term building the plane as we fly it. And so here's a picture of a plane on fire heading towards the ground um, with those words on it. And across the top, it says there are significant costs or across the middle, it says there are significant costs associated with most aspects of this plan without clear funding sources. And this is from the Marcus Alert work group, themselves pointing out the same thing Vic mentioned is that there's no money behind this. And building the plane as we fly it means we don't have time to think about how to meaningfully involve peers, suicide attempt survivors, impacted communities. It means we don't pay peers or people with lived experience for their time and expertise serving on this multi-month planning council when everybody else is getting paid. It means if you raise any objection, we will be sure to ignore it because we're building the plane as we fly it. it. Means we don't have time to make sure we don't duplicate existing problems or create new ones. And it means that the systems will continue to work as designed that is to systematically kill and harm black, brown and disabled people in distress with impunity. Next slide. And I'm not gonna go over this in the interest of time, but it's a very detailed triage framework, process map, flow chart. If someone calls 988, if someone calls 988, 911, this is what's gonna happen here. Um, and so I really what I want to point out, I'm not going to read everything on this slide, but it's really that we have a series of overlapping reform processes that they are now trying to streamline into one process. Like you can imagine what a mess this is, and it is a mess, <laughs> um, you know, and, and the response options will vary by local area. It's still being worked out, um, even as this is slotted 988 in our state or everywhere is slotted to go live in July of next year. Um, 
you know, and there's a lot of subjectivity in terms of what gets a mental health response and what's going to get the response as usual, including terms such as active aggression that are not really defined, um, florid psychosis, right? All of those things could trigger a law enforcement response. Um, and I also, you know, asked the committee <laughs> what would happen if someone called 988 on someone else right, just like people call 911 on other people all of the time. And this is, I'm talking about the 988 planning committee and no one really, they were like, that's a great question. We don't know. <laughs> Next slide, please. Um, and then um, this is from a survey that was given in our state um, and it had 681 respondents. I won't go into all the demographics, but, um, as you may imagine, it was mostly white, straight, middle-aged female family member respondents. 11% um, of responders identified as black, 4% as Latinx. Um, only three people utilized the Spanish language option, which I'm glad they had. Um, it doesn't fully capture, uh, you know, the community that I think we were trying to reach, but even then, you know, the, the, it says here, among all survey takers with personal experience, being able to choose a supporter and advocate was the most popular choice for increasing the likelihood of seeking help before the peak of crises. And I just also wanna highlight the second one on that list, um, which is um, people preferred a behavioral health response not involving a police officer. If that was guaranteed, they would be more likely to call. And our system is anything but that. Um, next slide. So here we have a picture of Calvin and Hobbes with his head exploding, and I'm not going to go into a whole lot of detail here, but another issue with building the plane while you fly it means that existing legal challenges um, will are not being taken into account. So without going into a ton of detail, here in the state of Virginia, according to the involuntary commitment laws, you have to be tr uh, transported by law enforcement. Even if you located alternative transportation that you would prefer, the, the cops have to trans transport you to that alternative transportation. So no matter what, if you're involuntarily committed and you're on an emergency um, commitment order, you're gonna have to encounter a cop. So what have we actually accomplished here? All right, last one, I promise. I know I'm a little over time. <laughs> This is how I feel about being on this committee. It's always like, or this planning council. Um, I'm a token most of the time. I'm the only one raising issues. People seem extremely annoyed that I'm doing that. Um, I don't doubt the good intentions, um, but I also am aware that the road to hell can sometimes be paved with them. So here's a picture of um, Gene Wilder as Willy Wonka in a purple suit and um, the words say, thank you. I truly appreciate your input. And I will now pass it over to Jess. Oops, sorry, I left myself on mute for a second there. Um, so uh, I am again here from Arapaho, Cheyenne, Ute, and Sioux land in so-called Colorado. Um, Colorado had a little bit of a different setup um, than what you've been hearing about from other states because Colorado implemented a crisis system years ago. Um, I do want to note that the reason this crisis system was created was as a response to um, mass violence, which has happened quite a lot in Colorado. Um, but it's not really the reason that I would choose for us to develop a, a systemic response for people who are experiencing um, a mental health concern. Um, so there, there's complications there um, because it was built on the idea that dangerous, dangerous people um, are people with experiencing mental health crisis, which um, we don't believe is, is actually true. Uh, so that's complicated. Um, our system already includes um, these options and we look at it, we call this the ladder of restrictive interventions. Um, Rocky Mountain Crisis Partners where I work provides the support line, which is our peer support services, the crisis line and the follow-up services. And then we're an entry point into the rest of the system that I'll talk a little bit more about. 
Um, but our, our line, when you call in, you have an option to choose peer support or clinical crisis care. And I believe that we might be one of the only places in the country that does that. So from the beginning, as we're going into this discussion, Colorado is a really a little bit more prepared um, to have conversations about what this looks like. And we've already funded not very well. Um, I wanna say we have not funded very well our crisis system, um, but we have passed some legislation for 988. So another difference between what's happening here and what's happening in some other places is that we have passed legislation tying the funding for 988 to cell phone bills, which is similar to how 911 is funded. So what that means is as the population of Colorado grows, the funding to our organization will grow. And there's an enterprise that oversees the funding that's made up of like telecom people for the most part, it seems like. Um, but the, the benefit here is that that tax can change, but it's in legislation that this tax will exist. So we already had a crisis system existing that's by legislation and we have the 988 funding and the combination of the two is what's going to be used to implement 988 as well as these other services. So our services around crisis don't stop with telephonic interventions. So I let you know about peer support, crisis intervention and follow-up. We also have walk-in clinics and mobile crisis, which are considered the next level of restriction, crisis stabilization units. Um, we put 911 and welfare checks up higher than that and then inpatient care um, up higher. There's lots of ways you could think about how restrictive each of these are, uh, but that's the way that we, we look at them. Um, in our system. That's how we are. Uh, we're trained to talk about it. Um, and I think I think is a pretty good assessment. So I want to just talk a little bit about each of these levels of crisis intervention and then some of the things that are going on on our um, our committee. So um, it's been really important to us to think about peer support as a true alternative service, that peer support is not something that's ancillary to crisis services. So it's not like you have to go through clinical geek gatekeeping to answer or to get to a peer. Um, and uh, that that doing this, this peer support work is not going to be co-opted peer support work. So it's a system of giving and receiving re support that's rooted in respect. There are shared responsibility for interactions and outcomes mutual agreement about what is helpful or safe. Uh, it's not based on psychiatric or medical models or diagnostic criteria and moves beyond self-concepts that are built on disability diagnosis and trauma. And so that's peer support under our, um, in our services. A crisis line intervention is sort of defined as providing resources, uh, maybe a grounding exercise. You might have coping or distraction skills, problem solving and planning, offer new perspectives. Um, showing care and concern, potentially some safety planning and potentially means restriction. Um, so that's sort of the difference between like a crisis line intervention and then peer support. On the follow-up side, uh, follow-ups are um, completed by our follow-up team, which includes both peers and crisis workers. We have follow-up services that might include a safety plan check-in. They might include ongoing messages of care and concern. It could be a check-in after a significant event. We also provide follow-up related to substance use concerns. So as people are looking at entering substance use services, we'll do phone calls with them in between um, the sort of moment of crisis that they have and accessing care because it can take a really long time to get into substance use services here. And we do follow up for anyone who's leaving the hospital following a um, uh, mental health or substance use uh, concern because we know that hospitalization increases the, um, the likelihood that someone will die by suicide. So our program is designed to, to reduce the negative impact of hospitalization. So those are our, our uh, phone options. Then we have walk-in centers and um, the sort of criteria for whether someone uh, fits into a walk-in center and the services they provide are um, that people need or want to be evaluated or seen face-to-face. -face. They are experiencing a behavioral health issue. They don't need a medical assessment. Um, they can travel safely um, or we can give them a travel voucher to travel safely. Um, they want some kind of complex or more in-depth intervention. Um, they're looking for assessment outside um, of their current environment. Um, and it paves the way for some referrals into other parts of the system. So walk-in services are the place that someone would have to, or mobile crisis are the place someone would have to access 
crisis stabilization. Um, mobile crisis is, uh, can only happen by a crisis line referral. Um, someone has to need or want to be seen face to face, um, have an acute need. Um, again, that's, this is sort of defined by, um, by the government. So it's a little bit complicated, but um, I think on our crisis line, we have pretty good standards around supporting people and getting what they want from mobile crisis. Um, they, have, they have a clear location. Somebody has to be able to get to them. The environment is um, safe enough for someone to go into. Um, we have a, a pretty broad standard about what safe enough looks like. And then we help folks to create an environment that's less likely to um, in, involve police involvement later on. Um, there, if there are barriers to traveling, a person can't make it to a walk-in clinic, mobile crisis is appropriate. And um, different teams who provide this response respond differently. So for the state of Colorado, we have one hotline and warm line, community mental health centers for the most part, and then some other contractors are who deliver these mobile crisis and walk-in services throughout the state. So because of that, there's a response looks really different in those places, whereas it doesn't look very different um, when you call the crisis line. Um, crisis stabilization is accessible through the walk-in clinics um, or through mobile crisis. And then a clinician has to determine someone needs a higher level of care. It's a one to five day stay. Um, and these typically look pretty different than hospitals. Um, they're like designed to be um, a lower level. People can wear their own clothes, things like that. But they can be admitted voluntarily or involuntarily. Um, so that's, uh, to me, that's, this is kind of one of the pitfalls of our crisis stabilization unit. I would prefer that any intervention in our um, crisis system be voluntary. Um, so for us, some of the things that were important to look at when we were working through um, our planning grant is how we're going to take what we currently do, um, evaluate what's working and what's not, and then make it better um, and in increase the scope for 988. Um, so we're looking at a different kind of increase because we already, ha already have a state crisis line um, and we have more capacity built between our um, passing legislation, the existing legislation and the existing system. So the conversations that we're having um, tend to look more like how do we put the information about what else, what's already going on into our planning grant uh, responses and then also what do we need to do to make this most effective? Um, well, some of the other differences for us doing this planning grant have included that we are having really explicit in, um, discussions about IVR and the importance of being able to continue to access peer support, which are not happening very much nationally and, and certainly not on most local levels, um, that we're having pretty big discussions uh, around how we merge our current crisis line volume that comes in through a different line with 988 um, and what that looks like over time. Um, and we um, automatically designated um, because, because we had an existing, existing hotline um, and we had people with lived experience like me uh, on this group from the beginning, we designated places for people with lived experience to be on the committee that were paid positions. Um, so that looked really different and there was much more involvement from a more diverse kind of community in Colorado than what I saw in other places. So to us, the importance of an IVR option. IVR is when you call in how you get to choose um, who you talk to. Um, so right now, when you call the Lifeline or 988, um, you have an option for veteran Spanish, or um, it just takes you straight to your local center. Um, we Once we get to a local center, uh, for Colorado, that means our center, and we want to be able to offer the option for peer support before um, people then go on to, uh, to clinical services. So um, we would be adding an IVR option that's um, after the IVR options that 988 already provides. Um, there's been some pushback and discussion about what that looks like, um, but our state has made a determination that that's something we care about preserving and will be moving forward with in our implementation of 988. Um, so we'll see what that looks like uh, for our interactions with, um, with the national groups as we move forward. Um, so with preserving uh, peer support in 988, the things that are important to us are that um, this is still an alternative to traditional interventions. We're not doing screening and assessment. 
we're not using coercive interventions. It is a different standard than least restrictive intervention, which is the standard for our crisis line. Um, that it's mutual, not paternalistic. Safety is defined in relationships and not by policy and process. Um, there's separate guidance for the average interaction length, volume, occupancy, and other call center data, which is some boring stuff. Um, but there's pay equity between our peer services and our crisis services, which was built into our budget that passed. Uh, and that peer support infrastructure exists in our organization. Um, and it's not just like peers reporting to clinical uh, providers. Um, whoops, I'm gonna go, go back for just a moment. So for us, um, preserving peer support has kind of emerged as a um, primary goal of our work here. Um, so things that are, things are a little bit different in Colorado because we have so much to go off of, but it also has um, pushed us to kind of resist. Um, sometimes it pushes us in a way that has us resisting um, changing things that currently exist. And I think there's room for that. Um, so I think it's really important that we're evaluating the role of law enforcement involvement in law enforcement in our work um, and things like that. Um, that didn't really happen in our planning grant in the way that I would have wanted them to because we spent so much time focusing on things like, like this. Um, so the planning grants really operated differently from state to state. Um, so I'm gonna just talk through the overarching kind of themes. Um, so some of the overarching themes and then I'll pass it on to some other folks to um, go a little bit more in depth. Um, so. Uh, reform was one of the big uh, themes across states. There were discussions about reforming current systems, not replacing them um, or really making them better. Um, there were big discussions that, um, that included um, problems with co-optation of peers. Um, surveillance uh, and geolocation were really common um, discussions. I should also mention that um, our, um, my organization ta has taken a position against geolocation services and um, that is really supported by law enforcement. So um, so I think that's an interesting uh, sort of different space in Colorado than in other places, but we, we don't want to use geolocation services. Um, we know that there have been discussions about workforce shortages, um, that lots of places are having discussions about funding problems. There's enmeshment with the car carceral state um, so one of our big discussions is about differentiating, excuse me, 988 and 911, but that's not the discussion that was happening in most states. And many of these conversations were dominated by system representatives. All right, Leah, did you want to talk about the privacy issues? Sure. Yeah, I can um, just briefly um, touch on these, you know, Jess has talked about this a little bit as well as Vic. Um, but yeah, just, there's a lot of concern. Um, I know even in our state, the folks on our planning council didn't even know what any of the objections were to having a geolocation function like you have with 911, where they, they can even track you up to like the floor of a building that you're in, right? So, you know, I think it's interesting. The American Association of Suicidology was um, one of the only organizations in a public comment to the FCC that raised any kind of issues around the fact that if people know they're gonna be tracked, they may not reach out. Um, of all the suicide prevention groups, um, they were the only one that raised a serious issue about this. And then um, many, many, many of the telecom groups, it's interesting, I don't know what their motives are, I'm sure they're not great. <laughs> but the fact that they were raising issues, right, uh, here they say, would the knowledge that the caller, caller's location, even including apartment or room number, is available to the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline and could be shared by the lifeline with local authorities, potentially discourage callers. <laughs> you know, the fact that that MITEL is kind of on to this when some of these other groups are not really putting it on their radar um, should tell you a lot. <laughs> and that's pretty much what I had to say um, on that. Um, anything else that either of you wanted to add about the overarching issues?
Okay. No, I think we can move into this uh, section on grassroots and abolitionist alternatives because this is the exciting part. Great. All right. Well, I can um, then kick us off just with um, some resources for you all. Um, and I will say that, um, you know, I very much come at this from an abolitionist perspective. I don't think law enforcement has any um, meaningful use in the mental health space and pretty much I'm against law enforcement in general um, in our society. So this is a guide called Interrupting Criminalization, um, which is led by researchers Mariam Kaba and Andrea J. Ritchie. And I highly recommend a new book um, by uh, Mariam Kaba, which is a compilation of, of Mariam's work called We Do This Till We Free Us. So if anybody is interested in, in learning more about the abolitionist movement, that's a very accessible book. Um, so this guide, you know, if you're looking for some support in your state, um, it highlights the considerations for real meaningful shifts away from law enforcement and towards autonomous self-determined community-based resources and responses to unmet mental health needs. So that, that guide is available um, for free online and I can share um, the link if anybody needs it. Um, next slide. So they've created also a checklist. And so, yeah, here's a, a link as well to the checklist. Yeah, happy to drop those in the chat. Um, happy to do that, y'all. Um, but yeah, this is particularly useful. I love sharing this. This is developed by the same folks um, that you can use to assess the mental health crisis response model in your state or locality, right? So they're, they're giving you the questions that you would want to consider um, if you are advocating in this space, right? So there's a lot of issues we weren't able to go into about all the different models of crisis response, um, but this is very much based on moving away from law enforcement altogether. Next slide. Um, so you can check out the full um, checklist. I'm not gonna, in the interest of time, I'm not gonna talk too much more about it, um, but it's a fantastic um, resource. And then the other thing I wanted to share is that if you are kind of interested in continuing on and um, you know having more of an impact in your own mental health crisis uh, systems and responses and reforms, this is a two-day workshop that really goes over that defund the police, invest in community care guide. Um, so that could be a great opportunity. I'm definitely going to sign up um, to be a part of that event. Um, so just wanted to put that on everyone's radar as well. Um, and then the next, the last thing I wanted to talk about, oh, go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Um, the last thing I wanted to talk about is the um, macro program. And I am not in Oakland. I'm not trying to speak <laughs> on behalf of the folks that created that program. I don't claim to know everything about it. Um, but one thing I just wanna say is that it really did come out of a much more grassroots collaboration than anything that I have seen um, in so-called Virginia. Um, it's very much based on a civilian model, not clinicians or cops. Um, it's housed within the fire department um, and it is a pilot program. And I, I do have an objection to that because it seems like all we can ever do is get these pilots going, right? And that we need so much more than that. But it is very much a community grassroots collaboration and these groups are not gonna let the Oakland City Council off the hook. So I definitely um, you know, encourage if you wanna learn more about this program, I do think it's one of the better ones out there. And that's it for me. All right, I'm gonna just spend a moment talking about some types of crisis intervention that I think are really important in differentiating in your communities um, because making sure that a 988 is sort of um, a separated issue from 911 is really useful. So um, there are law enforcement first responses, and this is not what 988 is supposed to be. So we should really be thinking about this as a separate issue. Not, law enforcement first responses can look like 
co-response or diversion. Um, co-responders are usually a social worker who goes with a law enforcement officer. Diversion might be diversion to a, a crisis line. <laughs> oh, sorry about my cough. Um, or it could be diversion to a program like CAHOOTS um, or those other programs where um, someone other than law enforcement is going. The concern that I have with law enforcement first interventions is that all of the screening for these um, programs being utilized goes through a, a 911 responder. And so they're going to look at it through the lens of law enforcement and look for things like um, if there's crime or if they feel like there's an intervention that's emergent um, that's needed. Um, so you're more likely to have law enforcement contact because you're involving law enforcement. Mental health first responses are things like a crisis line, mobile crisis, walk-in centers, and crisis residential. Uh, peer support first responses are things like support lines, warm lines, mobile crisis, drop-in centers, and respite. And then there's community-based responses that can look like mutual aid networks, community centers, and neighborhood organizing, which is usually going to be done outside of these big systems. And for good reason, because these big systems are, um, are ones that are often problematic for people and expose them to risk. So any of these responses can include people with lived and living experience, which I think is really important to note. Um, these two in the middle are the two that are most commonly going to be responses that would come from 988. Um, and so ideally, uh, from our perspective, um, ideally you would um, call 988 and have the option for a mental health first or a peer support first response. And ideally throughout the whole system, you could go through accessing services that you want from a peer or from a crisis um, clinician or crisis staff. And then those would be sort of equally funded. Um, I think it's also important that as we're thinking about these reforms, we are thinking about whether they are reformist reforms to what we're doing or abolitionist reforms. Um, I am always more interested in abolitionist reforms to our work so that we're moving toward um, reducing funding to police and reducing the access that police have to the community. So as we're building crisis services, we want to keep in mind, does this reduce funding to police? Does it challenge the notion that policing equals safety? Does it reduce the tools and tactics of, of a policing? And does it reduce the scale of policing? Um, and this information also comes from a, um, a document um, that's really, really useful that talks about this in terms of um, policing specifically as opposed to mental health crisis response. Um, but as we're developing our mental health crisis responses, um, looking at them through this lens can be really useful. Um, and it's been really powerful for us in our discussions in Colorado and thinking about how do we create a crisis system that's at least um, taking abolitionist steps, even though it's not an abolitionist system. Um, so that's been, been really useful here. And I recommend kind of taking that lens as you are looking at your systems. Um, the documents that Leia referenced earlier are really good, uh, really good documents for supporting you in doing that. That checklist is really helpful. Um, but these are the, the kinds of questions I ask is, does it do these things? And I'll turn it over to Vic. Thanks, Jess. Yeah, and I'm going to draw a little bit on that, that fourth box um, in the types of crisis intervention that those community-based supports and what does, what does that look like? And, and sometimes it can be a crisis response and sometimes it can be addressing the, the root causes of what leads people to crisis. And I want to just talk in a couple of different pieces. So one, um, state-funded peer-run respite, such as the ones that exist here in Wisconsin. And then um, what does it look like to have informal respites, community care pods, and other community-based supports? Um, now, these things are typically outside of those um, crisis continuums. Uh, in Wisconsin, peer respites are, are not considered part of the, the continuum of crisis services. Um, and and I think there's pros and cons to that. So on, on the one hand, I think it's really good that it, there's not that risk of somebody um, getting assessed or interacting with um, coercive responses related to a mental health crisis. Um, however, 
it does make it sometimes harder for people to even know that things like pure respite are um, a viable alternative. And so the, the challenge then becomes how do we um, alert people to these alternatives if they are not wanting to access um, the typical crisis services for whatever reason, whether it's um, lack of culturally responsive supports, whether it's a, a fear of interaction with law enforcement, there's a myriad of reasons why people would not want to engage um, in those crisis services. And so then I think it becomes a challenge for those of us who are activists and advocates to um, do more outreach and meaningful work to create these within our own communities. So I wanna um, on the next slide, talk a little bit about what does exist um, here in Wisconsin as one example. And these are uh, peer run respites that are stunt funded by a straight state grant. And there are currently five of them, soon to be six, that are all located in um, residential areas in different regions of Wisconsin that are completely voluntary alternatives and completely run by people with lived experience. Um, next slide. So these are a couple of photos of the inside of Monarch House Peer Run Respite. And you can see it's a bedroom that is actually a bedroom. It has, <laughs> it's a private bedroom. Folks can choose to lock it from the inside. Um, nobody else um, goes into somebody else's bedroom without their consent. There are no uh, bed checks or things that, like that that happen at other crisis facilities or psychiatric um, inpatient facilities. There are no clinical assessments. It, um, starts with a conversation about what's going on in your life and finding out what the person is needing and wanting in terms of support with navigating any mental health or substance use challenges that are happening in their life. And then an opportunity to stay overnight at one of the respite houses for up to between five and seven days. And then um, in Wisconsin, uh, respites also operate warm lines. So there is that opportunity for over the phone peer support that again is anonymous and private and um, outside of the crisis continuum. So folks who call those warm lines know that um, they can call, talk about whatever they want and know that it's not going to um, get documented or tracked back to any kind of clinical assessment. Next slide. Um, there are a lot of different ways that community-based support happens. And this usually happens with withdrawing on what it already exists in the community. And so this is going to be where um, people who, for example, are connected with faith communities may develop their own sort of response of how do we um, support a member of our congregation who is having a hard time and um, things that um, will likely be more culturally relevant than calling uh, a crisis line, having no idea who is going to be on the other side of the line, if they speak your language, if they know anything about your um, background, or will there be harm from any kinds of uh, lack of cultural awareness that happens on those crisis support lines. Mutual aid societies have a long history of um, providing support. Um, typically, you know, mutual aid societies have had a historical precedence of um, supporting people's um, funeral expenses and uh, things related to physical health. And I think there's a natural um, kind of over, uh, parallel to providing support during times of crisis. There are also under the radar respites. And um, again, there's an access issue, a barrier there, where if you are not connected to those communities that um, have developed some very tight knit uh, communication and, and care pods where um, it's kind of a sort of underground sort of um, existence of knowing where to find them and who to ask in order to get that, that crisis care at a, a home-like place, um, it can be a little bit harder to access, but they do exist. Um, I wanted to also give um, an example of something in Wisconsin 
um, and that's the, the little bubble there with the, the scissor and comb. Um, the style and substance mental health and community resource training. This was a grant that funded um, support for uh, black barbers and stylists in the Milwaukee area to um, create space for having those conversations about mental health. So it was a way of doing peer support in um, a location where um, people already go in the community, where there's already um, a community of people and a way to create some of those natural supports in a way that isn't interacting with uh, a formal mental health system. And then finally, um, we wanna get to a point of addressing the social factors that lead people to crisis in the first place. So we can't talk about crisis response without talking about the root causes of things that lead people into the place of crisis. So social action needs to address those contributing factors such as living wages, affordable housing, childcare, all of those things that contribute to making for a meaningful life that will not lead people to that point of crisis. Um, and I will, let's see, turn it over. Oh, actually, <laughs> I think I'm next up with talking about advocacy directions. So um, with these final moments, we wanna talk about what do we do next? And so we are each gonna talk a little bit about what are some possibilities of what do we do with the current system as it exists. Um, so first of all, uh, no clinical key gatekeeping of peer support on the line. And just uh, mentioned this already that, you know, peer support needs to operate autonomously without um, a barrier of needing a clinical assessment in order to qualify for it. Um, join or sit in on your planning council and say unpopular things. <laughs> Sometimes the best you can hope for is just to show up and be heard. And in my experience, what that will lead to is folks messaging you privately or emailing you afterwards and saying, hey, thanks for speaking up. Um, let's talk a little bit more. I have some questions about what you said. So have that, have the awareness of, of when things are happening in your region, show up when you can, um, say the things that um, other folks may not be willing or able to say. Advocate against geolocation. And sometimes your libertarian neighbors will be um, allies in this when um, there is uh, conversations around personal liberty. So uh, I know that is the case in certain regions here in Wisconsin, and that is something to be aware of as you look at advocacy options. Advocate for a really detailed understanding of what is this relationship between 988, 911, and other crisis reforms. Get some real clear understanding and language. And finally, advocate against that, that building the plane as you fly it. Um, that was a catchphrase that I heard in, in my meetings as well here in Wisconsin. And it was interesting talking with Leah to find out that, that um, we were hearing the same talking points um, nationwide about this. And you know, there is this sense of urgency right now that we have to make things happen because this was already in the works and we just have to make it work. And I think there is space to say, no, we can slow down. We can rethink this. Um, and with the next slide, I wanna just offer one final anecdote about what those small victories can look like. And so in my experience, I was able to have some additional meetings um, with uh, the folks who are convening the 988 um, Planning Coalition in Wisconsin and to have some really candid conversation about, well, what is one thing we can do is provide a little bit more informed consent. So when folks are calling these crisis lines, they have some understanding of what they might be able to encounter and what are some of the benefits and risks of calling. So this screenshot here, it says crisis services, someone to talk to. This is a screenshot of an updated page on the Wisconsin Department of Health Services talking about where they can access, where folks can access crisis lines um, for support. And 
because of some of these conversations that are continuing to happen, language has been added from the local um, MHA in the state to say that many of these resources listed here may use restrictive in interventions like active rescues, wellness or welfare checks, involving law enforcement or emergency services. You can ask if this is a possibility at any point in your conversation, if this is a concern for you. So this is a small <laughs> success, but an important one where people will hopefully have a little bit more understanding of how these lines operate and what are the things they want to be aware of if they decide to reach out to services like this. And um, that's all I've got from my advocacy directions. I'll turn it over to Leia for, um, for their thoughts. Yeah, I um, I don't know that I have all that much more to add. Um, uh, you know, I think you know y'all covered it um, very well. I am definitely going to take a, a hint um, from Wisconsin, and uh, and from Colorado, and try to see if I can get this kind of language um, worked in um, in our state as well. Because right now we're kind of on the marketing aspect of the planning committee. So it's, we have to be very careful uh, how we're marketing these services. So yeah, um, anything else you wanted to add, Jess? Um, okay, well, I think we're good. Um, so yeah, at this point, we can absolutely um, switch over to our question and answer session. Um, I see some questions are coming in to the Q and A, um, and then if you have other questions, you're welcome to drop them into the chat, and we'll try to keep an eye on them coming in. Um, so the first question that I'm seeing is: Are there provisions for deaf callers or deaf family members? Um, uh, I'll share my understanding, and then Jess and Vic, if you have anything to add. Um, my understanding is that there are supposed to be 988 provisions, but that is only because of the advocacy of deaf folks, because at first that was not even really in the plan. Um, but my understanding is there will be um, some text and other accessible options. Did, do either of you have more to add on that? Well, I know that at, um, text and chat is part of uh, 988 now, it was added on. Um, so I know that that's the case. Um, at my call center, we have TTY and then also translation into, um, I, I wanna say close to 200 other languages that we can use through our translation service. That's not the case for every call center that exists, but that's definitely the case for, for Colorado. Um, and we are also implementing um, Spanish speaking services over the next year. So people can talk to someone who is, um, a, a Spanish speaker without translation, ideally on our lines um, at some point here in the next couple of years. Thank you so very much. Um, and then um, Dr. Dennis, I'm wondering if you might uh, want to potentially uh, come uh, on video to share your comment, just wanted to give you that possibility. Okay, okay, thank you for answering. I unfortunately do not see the chat comment. Does anybody else see the chat comment? I can scroll up and yes, uh, I'm gonna go ahead and read it. Um, while racial and class variance is mentioned, it is being downplayed in the role for these problems. This includes how indigenous, black, non-white, Hispanic, not white, non-white Latinx and Asian people have difficulty finding suicide prevention outlets not led by white people and not led by light melanin people. The racism and colorism is a big part of funding problems. 
the white-based materials used in academic programs and trainings and policies. I have yet to find a mental health session and suicide prevention session that addresses this as the main topic rather than a quickly mentioned side topic. Our demographic and cultural identities and experiences shape every part of these issues. Uh, I think I think these are really uh, critical issues to be addressing. It's something that um, I feel like I bring into space a lot, but not. I haven't found a lot of good strategies for moving um, moving forward within these systems. Um, we have a lot of discussions about like increasing utilization of these services that are really clearly designed for and by white folks. Um, uh, of their wanting to in increase utilization um, in communities of color. I, I know that um, that's something that's talked about um, on the national level as well, pretty frequently. And I think it's, it's very clear that these services have been dangerous uh, in the past to people and that's why they don't use them. And that there are other strategies that exist that probably deserve as much funding and attention and aren't getting aren't getting them um and i think that's i think it's a, a complicated space um to to work in for us uh, and i would like to see some more attention nationally going toward uh these issues and then also in lo local community spaces going toward um sort of dealing with the fact that all of our services have been designed with white folks in mind um and I know that there are some small organizations doing lots of work around this, uh, but there's not a lot of, uh, of movement happening at, at state and national spaces um, to address this besides trying to adapt what currently exists and make it less harmful or better or whatever, um, whatever an organization might propose. Um, and I think that's, that's uh, complicated and um, a bit of a problem. Um, we've been pursuing some funding to um, include like bicultural programming instead of just um, translation services, um, especially for Spanish speaking populations in Colorado. Um, and I think that's, uh, that's also a complicated thing to introduce, but one of the ways that we're going about that is by not assuming that the service is gonna look like our current services. So it doesn't, wouldn't necessarily be peer support in the way that it's currently uh, approached or crisis services in the way that they're currently approached, but within the sort of auspices of a telephonic intervention, because that's what we we do at our organization, what would it look like to do um, programming that's culturally relevant to uh, the folks who speak Spanish in Colorado. Um, and so, so that's one example of something that's slowly moving forward in a really small way, because um, it doesn't have a ton of funding, um, but I think there are some other other spaces for that. Thank you so much for that, Jess. Vic, did you have anything else you wanted to add? Um, I, I do wanna add um, that it was a failure of our presentation today to not um, more concretely talk about the um, racial disparities and the need for more culturally relevant supports. And that is something I am taking forward in future presentations. Yeah, I wanna echo 100% what Jess and, and Vic said. And thank you so much, Dr. Dennis, for your comment. Okay, I think we have time for one more question. We have so many good ones here. Um, let's see. Uh, Anna is asking, uh, many of us who are running peer peer run programs get tapped to be on the planning committees for our states. We do not always have the space to do deep dives into the adv advocacy issues. Are there existing resources uh, or other materials we can access so we don't have to reinvent the wheel? Um, so I wanna say that I, I really do think that that checklist that I shared earlier is a great way to assess what you're, what's going on in your state. I know it's, it may be hard to figure out what's going on in your state, but I would definitely refer you to the checklist um, and I'll drop it in the chat again.
that's not it. <laughs> um, I will make sure to get that in the chat. That's Princess Blanding's video. Um, and I know we only have a minute left. Um, I'm sorry we did not get to more questions. Um, I don't know if uh, our folks from NARPA or DRC have any last parting words. Hi, this is Vanessa. I don't have anything else to add. Thank you so much for that information and also for considering the addition that was suggested by Dr. Dennis. Thank you so much.